Hello, I'm Ted Feldman from Chicago, here with Professor Martin Bergman from Hamburg, and we're going to discuss the role of left atrial appendage occlusion for patients with atrial fibrillation. And I think the, the first point is defining uh, why left atrial appendage mechanical or device occlusion has any role in an era where we are uh, really inundated with new oral anticoagulant therapy. So why do we need an alternative? Well, I think for the last couple of years, we've seen that many patients have profited from the introduction of the direct oral anticoagulants, but we see more and more patients who cannot make, take them for a long time. These are patients that have regularly uh, surgery, where they need to, to stop it and then start it again. Uh, we have patients with acute uh, coronary syndromes, which we would like to take on platelet inhibition, but we can't because we increase the bleeding risk. And uh, there are patients uh, that still bleed even with the new oral anticoagulants, because in comparison to warfarin, bleeding is not decreased regarding gastrointestinal bleeding and other things. So I, I've also encountered some individual patient situations that are uh, uh, driven much more by lifestyle choice. For example, a, uh, a young man, Chad's one, low risk, uh, whose whole life was martial arts. <laughs> and uh, getting him off of oral anticoagulants and treating him with uh, a device restored his life. Uh, another young man, uh, his whole life is about skiing. Uh -huh. So getting him back out into his avocation was critical. And uh, another in an older man who in his retirement was uh, traveling to remote places in the world and feared terribly having uh, trauma and being in Central Africa or somewhere in the wilds of South America and not being able to uh, manage that. So I think we can go beyond the strict medical boundaries uh, when we consider some of the, uh, the value of uh, a non-pharmacologic alternative. I, I would uh, fully agree. I think the beauty is that uh, for all these patients that for one or the other reason cannot take oral anticoagulants for long term, we do not need to go back to aspirin, which actually leaves them with an excessive stroke risk. But we can now go for an interventional procedure, which is easy to perform in experienced hands, and where we now know that we have good uh, clinical results and uh, randomized data to support the strategy. So you bring up a critical point, and that is what are the data that underpin the use of this therapy? And maybe you'd like to comment on what you think are the most important trial findings. Well, I think um, over the last uh, five years, we've seen uh, important data coming up, especially with the Watchman device, uh, which I think we both use. Um, there's a randomized trial with the Protector F where we now have the four-year data published which actually extend patients to five years and we've seen uh, a statistically significant um, reduction in uh, stroke and bleeding in comparison to uh, oral anticoagulants and we've seen the recent Prevail Tyler which mainly showed us that periprocedural uh, complications uh, can be limited to an amount which is um, neglectable actually. And we've seen from the European side a lot of registries. We've run registries, also our colleagues from Frankfurt have run registries where we could show that dual antiplatelet therapy following the device, which was an issue in the early days, is safe and easy to perform. And so we have an option for all these patients that we want to treat. So in, in the uh, US-based randomized PROTECT AF trial, we have about 800 patients, and at four years, not only, as you mentioned, the reductions in, uh, in stroke, but most importantly, I think, and very impressively, a two-thirds reduction in all-cause mortality. And one of the things that uh, kind of perplexes me a little bit is that this finding uh, has not impressed our practice community so much. It's a bigger treatment effect than aspirin for acute MI. Uh, and I think uh, we often criticize randomized trials as not being real world, but you mentioned the registries. Maybe you could tell us a few words about the size of some of the registries and, and how that helps us uh, with 
the real world? Well, I would think the critical point is that people have to put together the uh, various trials to really get a picture on that. But uh, what I sense is, especially here uh, at this EuroPCR 2015, we now have an increasing number of sessions on this. We have an increasing number of people getting interested to it. The structural heart people coming from the TAVI field and the macho clip field, which are mature, are now looking for new procedures uh, where we can use the same uh, techniques, combining echo, uh, CT uh, and uh, a challenging uh, uh, procedure. And uh, so we actually um, finally see the data that we have uh, coming to practice. And uh, regarding your point, I think we will see more data coming up with the evolution registry that was run with the Watchman device over the last one and a half years. And where we now can say that the uh, enrollment is complete since of uh, 8th of May. And how many patients? That's a thousand patients mm -hmm. uh, uh, that have been implanted all over Europe, including Russia and um, also the uh, Middle East. And uh, we're collecting data on stroke, on bleeding, on periprocedural uh, complication, everything. And uh, I think the first data will come out uh, this ESC uh, 2015. So one point that this uh, sort of touches on is uh, we have about 6,000 patients in uh, the original trials for Watchman. You're referencing another 1,000 in a registry. Uh, and this is the largest trial and volume of data uh, on any of the, the various uh, LAA occlusion devices. Um, maybe you could comment on the importance of the data set. Is this device specific or can we generalize this? Well, I think uh, we have the responsibility, especially in Europe, uh, that we should go with the evidence. And uh, we have the nice setup here in Europe that we can use every device uh, which is CE marked. Um, but our community has uh, to discuss and maybe even force the companies that we work with to do the randomized uh, trials. And um, for me, this has meant that we, I mainly go with the very easy to use, uh, straightforward Watchman device, and we are testing other devices in studies and registries um, so to learn uh, about these devices, maybe some benefits. Um, they, we need devices that, uh, where we have the 5% of thrombus risk on the device reduced. Uh, maybe devices where we do not need any anticoagulation afterwards. Uh, and uh, there may be some anatomies, the LAA anatomy, maybe you can comment on that also, is very variable. Uh, I, I like the procedure because every time you get a new challenge and you finally know how to solve it. So there, there will be a niche for several devices, I say, but for me, it's, it's one main device because we can solve 95% of the anatomies with it. Well, I, I think your, your point about anatomic variability is really critical and that there is going to be no one perfect device. But uh, the other thing I see with the development of Watchman is the next generation device will be a little shorter and a little uh, less traumatic in terms of the design of the wireframe so that the proportion of patients that are difficult to treat will diminish even further. But an another thing that I think is very curious is a perception that the utilization of Watchman, the types of patients, the understanding of indications is different in the U.S. and in Europe. So maybe you could address uh, whether, whether we are more similar or more different. Well. Uh if you look at the wording that we have, we have a 2B indication since 2012 for patients that cannot take oral anticoagulation. Uh, however, it's not that whether it must be an absolute contraindication or just a relative contraindication. And now we have the FDA wording where it uh, just says uh, LAA occlusion can be offered to everybody uh, where oral anticoagulation is not the optimal solution. Actually, my take home on that is uh, we are merging together. It's definitely not only the absolute contraindicated patients where we have to admit that we do not have randomized trials, but we will see the data out of the evolution registry because from what we know is I think 30% of the patients that we have included there, uh, the doctor said we have an absolute contraindication. 
Um, but for the rest, it's a relative contraindication. So it's actually exactly the patient that you now, with the FDA approval, for the not optimal solution, uh, probably will implant. Or where do you see the future in the years? It, it, it is uh, a paradoxical that the largest part of the database, certainly all the randomized trial data we have, are in relatively lower risk patients who are warfarin tolerant because it was required uh, in the study and that our organizations want to recommend the therapy for oral anticoagulant intolerant patients. And it's finding uh, the intersection of those circles, I think, that we're all struggling with. And I agree that on uh, both sides of the Atlantic, we're sort of migrating toward the idea that many patients who are oral anticoagulation intolerant are tolerant enough to have an implant, a short period of oral anticoagulant therapy, and then finally be free uh, of, of oral anticoagulation. And just one key point here is that I think there's a poor understanding in the practice community about the success rate of getting people off of oral anticoagulants, which we finally appreciate is 99% yeah. at one year, which is really critical, that the device succeeds at getting people off of, uh, of oral anticoagulants. So I, I think we've covered most of the, uh, the landscape of the therapy, and I think we might summarize by saying that uh, after a very long period of study, I think we're finally coming to find Watchman a role in practice, and uh, I think we're seeing a very steady growth of the therapy as our understanding of its niche uh, becomes clearer. And I think we can uh, just have everybody uh, coming interested in the procedure, and uh, this afternoon we will see a very practical uh, symposia on that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all.